Origin of the Nephilim in Mesopotamia. The Anunnaki in the Epic of Gilgamesh compared to the Nephilim flood narrative. Scholars have long debated whether the Anunnaki in the Epic of Gilgamesh are the same beings as the Nephilim of Genesis 6. There is a direct connection between these two groups of entities which sheds light on this critical question. One of the biggest problems with interpreting certain parts of ancient texts, such as the book of Genesis and other writings, can be traced back to an almost fanatical obsession. Many have treated all such writings as purely historical documents, rather than trying to understand them within their proper cultural context. We run into all kinds of challenges because we deal with stories initially intended to be read or listened to for entertainment or some religious significance, rather than for their scientific or historical accuracy. This does not mean that these narratives have no value in terms of what they can teach us about ancient societies, but means that scholars need to approach them from different perspectives if they wish to make any progress when it comes time for interpretation. Was Noah's flood an actual event? The Epic of Gilgamesh, written in ancient Akkadian and Babylonian, is an epic poem discovered on 12 clay tablets. It tells the story of Gilgamesh, a demigod king who seeks to find immortality after being grieved by the death of his companion, Enkidu. The hero travels across the world and meets Utnapishtim, the survivor of a great flood sent by the gods to destroy humankind. After hearing about Utnapishtim's story and lessons, Gilgamesh returns home to his city empty-handed. The lineage between these two stories is undeniable. The entire account found in the Epic of Gilgamesh reads like a precursor to Noah's flood narrative in Genesis 6-9. Both are similar. In both accounts there were warriors from a godly race who descended from heaven to take wives from among human women. Genesis 6-2, Gilgamesh 11. Both stories featured identical names for their heroes, Utnapishtim and Noah. Gilgamesh 11, Genesis 9, 29. My name is Michael McPherson, and you're listening to The Sumerian Origins Podcast. With each episode in this podcast series, we look closely at the rise of different Mesopotamia empires, their high strangeness, out-of-this-world mythology, how each Mesopotamia civilization and dynasty fell from grace, how they came to be in the first place, who were the movers and shakers, and how after a glorious epic they ended in flames. With guest speakers weekly and controversial topics across the board, we are sure you will be on the edge of your seat. Like all ancient civilizations and empires, the fall of one gives way to the rise of another. Like the phoenix rising from the ashes. Sumerian Origins is a remarkable journey on how each Mesopotamia culture is often recycled and typically morphs into another form of culture. The Sumerians, Akkadians, Babylonians, Assyrians, Persians, Elamites, Kassites, Hittites, Hurrians, and Mitanni to name a few. They left us cuneiform writing and the Anunnaki legacy. In this episode, I want to look at an origin of the Nephilim in Mesopotamia that has all but faded from memory in many parts of the world. That's the real story of Mesopotamia. I want to tell the story of how this remarkable aspect of Mesopotamian cultures is often overlooked. Furthermore, both heroes received divine instructions for constructing arcs to save all air-breathing life on Earth from an imminent cataclysmic flood. Gilgamesh 11, Genesis 6, 14 the legendary kings of Uruk. Gilgamesh, who ruled the capital of Uruk around 2800 BC, is arguably one of the most famous and vital figures 
in ancient Mesopotamian mythology. He was thought to be a two-thirds god, one-third man, making him a demigod, half human and half divine. Gilgamesh was a mighty warrior, whose prowess in combat inspired fear throughout Mesopotamia. He slew lions barehanded and killed ferocious beasts with ease. Many myths about him describe his adventure as king of Uruk, but the most famous stories about Gilgamesh are those found in the Epic of Gilgamesh, the earliest known epic poem that dates to approximately 2100 to 2000 BC. The epic poem opens in a grandiose style. The Epic of Gilgamesh opens in grandiose style with a brief prelude describing the mythical origins of Gilgamesh. He is two parts god and one part man. He is the strongest of men and a great king. He has built the walls of Uruk, which are seven leagues as long, high as the walls of heaven, and wide enough for two chariots to pass side by side through its gates. Gilgamesh's fame has spread from Syria to Egypt. The text is fragmentary and not linear. The primary focus of the story is not Gilgamesh. It is about the gods and their relationship to humanity. I would say that the flood story is a side story of the gods. It is only one quarter of the epic. It is not even primarily about Gilgamesh, as much as it is about Enlil, one of the most influential gods in Mesopotamia. He decides he wants to wipe out humanity in a cataclysmic flood. Because humans disobey him, like all ancient gods, he has some pretty esoteric rules. The gods have decisions to make. The gods have a problem and they need to decide. The gods decide to send a flood. The gods decide to wipe out all life, save for one man who builds an ark. The gods decide not to let anyone know about their plans. One man is chosen, the storyteller's grandfather, and he is told to build an ark. How was Gilgamesh created? It is not immediately clear whether Gilgamesh was a natural person or a legendary figure, but many historians have hypothesized that he may have been on the throne of Uruk around 2700 BC. The text tells us that Gilgamesh was two-thirds divine and one-third human, which would fit with his reputation as a mighty king, responsible for incredible feats of engineering and building. The Epic of Gilgamesh predates the biblical flood story for thousands of years. It is believed to have endured in oral tradition for generations, before scribes wrote it when the Sumerian culture and language were on their way out. Both epics tell that Enki told Utnapishtim, Atrahasis and Ziyasudra their fates. The Epic of Atrahasis tells the story from several perspectives, but the critical action centers on Ea, saving Atrahasis from the flood. The Epic of Gilgamesh gives us a different perspective, focused on Utnapishtim and his advice to Gilgamesh. Archaeological evidence reveals that the Middle Bronze Age was a violent time. Even if Gilgamesh and the Nephilim are just mythical characters, a complex network of stories about their interaction with humanity existed. While we cannot be sure whether or not there was an actual flood, we know the Middle Bronze Age was a violent time. Archaeological evidence reveals widespread evidence of violent death during this period. Mass graves stuffed with weapons, bones that show injuries, and the destruction of entire cities can all be dated to this period. Several plausible reasons for the violence have been proposed. Climate change causing drought and famine, overpopulation leading to conflict over land or resources, or earthquakes or tsunamis triggering an environmental disaster which could support a literal interpretation of the flood. We may never know what exactly caused such extreme upheaval across ancient civilizations, but it is clear from archaeological evidence that something happened around 2100 BCE. Why do the gods send floods? Is it punishment, cleansing, or possibly both? The Flood Itself In the Gilgamesh epic, it is written that the gods sent a great flood to destroy humanity because of their evil ways. The Bible's Old Testament has similar language when it states that before the flood, humanity could repent and realize God's greatness and mercy. There are also similarities between how the flood is described in both texts. 
Both involve an overflowing river where people are forced to take refuge, death coming to all who do not get out, and a devastating deluge. The Bible calls it a great deep. However, there are significant differences in how this event is narrated and described. The Epic of Gilgamesh's Flood When writing about the flood in Gilgamesh, we can see that it is told from the point of view of Enkidu, a historical figure. Enkidu lived as a wild man for 28 years after he divorced his wife, Humbaba's daughter-in-law, Ishtar, whom he later married. After becoming a hermit living alone in the mountains, where he eventually died, Utnapishtim tells him about a storm god who visits him during sleep while he sits under his roof with two other friends and two young women. A rainbow appears above them, and they hear thunderous sounds from below them until they see the water rise into their house by 30 cubits, which were 13 feet. They all head upstairs, except for one woman. She stays behind, saying she will remain on top so that I may not be covered by water. The water keeps rising until they see it going up past 40 cubits, which would have been 15 feet at the time, and their house floats off into space on top of water mountains like a ship. Ships can be seen on both sides, and people who are being washed away on boats or being pulled along by ropes, tied onto trees held above. The Epic of Gilgamesh ends with a warning. It is important to note that the Epic of Gilgamesh does not end with the flood story. The gods keep the flood story a secret, and for a good reason. They do not want humanity to thwart death as they can. Gilgamesh fails in his goal, but returns with a new perspective on life. He learns he is mortal, and while this knowledge is painful, it gives him hope. If he cannot avoid death by being perfect like Uta Napishtim, or immortal like a god, then there is no need for perfection or immortality. The story concludes with Gilgamesh ruling over his people, justly and humanely. Did a flood wipe out all life on earth at once, including a race of half-human and half-angelic giants? Two accounts of a worldwide flood do not mean a worldwide flood happened. It is possible that the Epic of Gilgamesh and the account in Genesis are describing two separate floods, or perhaps even two completely discrete events, but using a similar language to describe them. There is every reason to believe that giants were supernatural beings. There is no reason to think that they were regular human beings with just an extra dose of growth hormone. There is also significant evidence to conclude that the Nephilim, or Anunnaki, were angelic creatures who mated with humans. Even if both accounts describe a single event and its participants, there would still be significant differences. There is no mention in the Epic of Gilgamesh of any laws that God gave humanity. After all, this was Mesopotamia, not Israel. Are the Anunnaki Sumerians in the Gilgamesh story the same as the Nephilim in the Bible? The connection between the Sumerian gods and the antediluvian giants known as the Nephilim is undeniable. The Nephilim are fallen angels who rebelled against God and cohabited with human women. The Anunnaki of Mesopotamian mythology were gods, or demigods depending on the account, born from a union between a god and a human woman, who was then worshipped by their human offspring. However, there are too many differences between the two stories to say that they are recounting one shared event, namely, Anunnaki versus Nephilim. What is the difference? To understand what is going on here, we must first look at the difference between the Anunnaki and the Nephilim. We will do this by examining their stories. The most famous story about the Anunnaki is a poem called The Epic of Gilgamesh, written in ancient Mesopotamia, around 500 BC, but dated further. In this poem, Gilgamesh meets with Utnapishtim, who has been made immortal by the gods. This is how he describes his time on Earth before he met Gilgamesh, there was a great flood, from which no one escaped except for me and my wife, who bore life through it, all in a boat. At dawn I saw land and bowed myself low to it seven times and seven times nine. On Mount Nemush I poured out a libation. When Utnapishtim opened his mouth to speak, he said to Gilgamesh, 
I will reveal to you, Gilgamesh, my friend, your ancestor, Bali, who begot you, was a mortal, but your mother was divine. Translations by Ryan Morhan. This story is reminiscent of the flood narrative found in Genesis 6, 8 to 12. But Noah found favor in the eyes of Yahweh. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a moral man, blameless among his contemporaries. Noah walked with God. The earth became corrupt before God and filled with lawlessness. And God said to Noah, Make yourself an ark, for behold, I will bring upon all flesh a flood. Let us look at some differences between these two stories to see where they diverge into different narratives. In both cases, we have an immortal being imparting wisdom about their family life when they were alive. The Nephilim The Nephilim is mentioned only twice in the Hebrew Bible and Jewish scriptures. Genesis 6-4 and Numbers 13-33 The word is often translated as giants or mighty men, but it comes from a root word meaning to fall, in this case, to fall like rain. The name itself refers to their parentage. In Genesis 6-4, we read that they were the offspring of sons of God, fallen angels, the Anunnaki, and daughters of men. This made them so special. They were not simply tall people with large bones. They were human or fallen angel hybrids, a new race of beings who lived before the flood and had great strength, wisdom, and longevity, according to Jewish tradition. These giants ruled over humanity until they began committing grievous sins against God. This led to their judgment at the hands of God using a worldwide flood sent by him. The Anunnaki, Sumero-Akkadian. The Anunnaki, a group of Sumerian, Babylonian, and Akkadian deities, are first written about during the Old Babylonian period, circa 1800 BCE. In Sumerian, Anunnaku means those who came from heaven to earth, or princely offspring. This name is associated with the Mesopotamian creation myth, which described how the gods created humans to do their work. The alternative spelling of Anunnaki is Anuna, some scholars believe that this variation is derived from an earlier tradition, different from that of the Sumerians. Other interpretations suggest that Anuna and Anunnaki share a common origin, as both words translate to those who came from heaven to earth. The Anunnaki can be found in many places throughout ancient texts. Sometimes they are called the Igigi, which translates as the great gods or the great ones, a closer look at the Sumerian gods, believed to be fallen angels. In the ancient Sumerian text, the Epic of Gilgamesh, Gilgamesh is a king who lives in Uruk, Mesopotamia. He also reigned on earth over 27,000 years ago. He is well known for his extraordinary strength and wisdom. This is written on a historical document known as the King's List, kept in Oxford's Ashmolean Museum. You might be astonished to know that in this epic text are accounts of an invasion of Earth by fallen angels or demonic beings, referred to as the Anunnaki. Though their exact origin is undetermined, it is believed they hailed from somewhere far off and beyond our known galaxy. These beings were also called sons of God, who came down from heaven to Earth and engaged in intermarriage with human females. This resulted in some rather strange offspring, giants. The Bible is very clear on this issue and refers to these giants as Nephilim, Genesis 6. The Mesopotamian culture was also very clear on this issue and always represented them as giants in their art. A closer look at the Mesopotamian gods believed to be fallen angels. Marduk is the patron deity of the city of Babylon and at one point was considered the national god by the Babylonians. Enuma Elish is regarded as a descendant of Enki, who is also known as Ea. Nergal is believed to have been given power over various pestilences and diseases. His son, Kuthar, was made to rule over Nippur after Ninurta was done with it. Nusku was primarily worshipped in Babylonia and considered a servant and messenger of the higher gods. He may have been an incarnation of Gugalana, 
also known as Taurus. Shamash was believed to be involved in administering justice, and he would represent truth against falsehood in legal matters. When disputes arose between people separated by a significant distance, they would appeal to Shamash for help in gaining justice by them invoking him to judge their case. He is depicted in reliefs at royal courts with his arms raised high, so that those who needed him could see him from far away. Sin had been regarded as being an aspect or facet of Anu's personality. However, since he lived for hundreds of millions of years in Mesopotamian mythology, especially among the Akkadians, he eventually gained his personhood since his father needed no more children than what he already had. Tammuz is probably most famous for being killed by Pazuzu, another demon that would later serve as an inspiration for character designs from the Exorcist movies. However, it should be noted that there are plenty of other myths dealing with his demise, aside from this one, such as dying through betrayal or via a hunting accident. In addition, although Tammuz is not explicitly mentioned anywhere else within scripture besides Ezekiel 8, 14 to 15, some scholars believe that references within Psalm 78, the connection between the Sumerian gods and the antediluvian giants known as the Nephilim, is undeniable, but it also comes with problems that need to be resolved or explained. An important distinction must be drawn between the biblical and Mesopotamian material regarding the divine offspring for the scholar wrestling with this problem. The Nephilim in Genesis 6, 1-4 are not divine beings themselves, as is written, but human beings of great stature, i.e. giants. They are called sons of God, because they descend from righteous lineages, specifically Seth, Noah's father, and Adam's third son, Genesis 5.3. In contrast to this view of the Nephilim, these gods are often depicted walking alongside kings as equals or even superiors in Sumerian and Akkadian mythology. In one instance, we even find a god sitting before a king like he is some servant to him, although this could be explained because many gods take on the form of men to communicate with humankind. How are the Watchers, the Nephilim, and the Mesopotamian mythology related? The Nephilim, according to the Hebrew Bible, were giants who helped create a world of chaos and violence. They are also known as Anakim in the Old Testament and Anak in Jewish mythology. They are mentioned in Genesis 6-4, saying, The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and afterward when the sons of God went to the daughters of men and had children by them. They were the heroes of old men of renown. They are also mentioned once more in Numbers 13.33. Anak is one of their leaders, Numbers 13.22, and is described as tall, Deuteronomy 1.28. His children were noted for being similarly tall among the Canaanites, Deuteronomy 2.10-11. According to Enoch I, the fallen angels who sired the Nephilim were punished by being imprisoned inside the lowest part of the earth, under a mountain of hard rock, which was sealed with a layer of water that was seven times deeper than all of Earth's oceans. These fallen angels, thus imprisoned, are called watchers. We find reference to this in both the Bible and the Quran. The name Nephilim seems to have been first coined by Josephus in his book the Antiquities of the Jews, written around 100 AD. For millennia prior to this, the Nephilim were described as giants or mighty men. In Mesopotamia, there is an ancient mythological story about how two powerful gods created two humans, Adapa and Titi, by mixing clay with blood and bones and occasionally saliva. Adapa is taught how to make bread, and he becomes an angler, while Titi learns to housekeep. One day they are invited up into heaven, where they meet Anu, who gives them instructions on what to do should their children get sick or injured. They then return home to continue living their lives, until one day they die, which later leads to their deification within the Mesopotamian religion, becoming known as Ia and Damkina, respectively. We will come back to this later. This story has been dated very close in time, if not contemporaneous, with Gilgamesh and Enkidu's stories. 
which also mentioned these demigods or superheroes having parents from amongst the gods or watcher, angels or fallen angels. One of the most famous epic poems from Mesopotamia was called The Epic of Gilgamesh, which tells the tale of a demigod who goes on an adventure and learns about life and death. The story is about Gilgamesh and Enkidu, two heroes who go on a quest to fight Humbaba, the forest guardian, home to an eternal tree from which one can obtain immortality. After they defeat Humbaba, they are given a reward by the gods because they successfully achieve their goal. Gilgamesh and Enkidu then fight with the Bull of Heaven, making them lose their lives but gain immortality as heroes in memory, instead of through stories written or spoken aloud by people who remember them fondly after their passing away forever into history's abyss. We may not have ever met these mythical characters personally, but we know about them today thanks to ancient texts like this one. The demigods in most ancient texts are not immortal but transcendental because they are more potent than mortal men and women. This is because their parents came from different divine planes or realms. In Mesopotamian, Sumerian, Babylonian and Assyrian mythology, the demigods are born of a human mother and a divine father, or by a human father and a divine mother. For example, the Sumerian king Gilgamesh was said to have been born of Lugalbanda, his father, who was a god with supernatural powers that came down to earth as an eagle. The second hero, Enkidu, was born to Prince Dumuzi. The Assyrian king Sargon I was born from the marriage between Ashur, the chief god of Assyria, and Ishtar, goddess of love and fertility. What does the Book of Enoch say about the fallen angels? The first humans were pure and innocent, but men lusted after them with these heavenly creatures who were much more powerful than them and had unachievable abilities for ordinary people. According to this book, which contains much information about the fallen angels, their offspring and their further actions, these 200 fallen angels, came down to earth to mate with human women. These fallen angels taught humans many occult sciences like astrology, magic arts, healing plants and herbs. They also taught them how to use metals and minerals found on earth. The Book of Enoch says that these heavenly creatures taught man all kinds of knowledge and trick them into worshipping false idols. According to Jewish and Christian traditions, the Watchers were angels who mated with human women, giving rise to a race of hybrids known as the Nephilim, sometimes also referred to as giants, mysterious beings that inhabited the lands of Canaan mentioned in Genesis 6-4, Deuteronomy 3-11, and Numbers 13-33. While some believe that these watchers were evil spirits that possessed human bodies, others say they were fallen angels who rebelled against God's wishes. In the Jewish tradition, these fallen angels are called Grigori or Irin, while they are referred to as Giborim in Aramaic and Aralim in Hebrew. However, most people refer to them simply as watchers. The Book of Enoch describes the watchers emerging from heaven after seeing what beautiful daughters humans have and then mating with them. Enoch author Joseph B. Lumpkin describes this mating process in great detail. The women then became pregnant, gave birth to large offspring. Their flesh was like that which is found among men, but their faces appeared like vipers' faces, Mesopotamian, Sumerian, and biblical. The best way to illustrate these different subjects' relationships is to use a few concrete examples. For instance, in the Mesopotamian religion and myths, an ancient god called Anu. Scholars have identified this deity as the primeval king of heaven. Now you can see one similarity as mentioned above. Both religions have deities that are perceived as being in charge or up above. Many elements of his character were comparable to Yahweh's in the Bible. He was depicted as a fatherly figure who wanted harmony and cared for his children, the humans. He was also protective, getting upset when any harm came to his children. He would destroy other gods in his wrathful moments and take their power away from them. One might say that even though these gods existed in entirely different religious traditions, they coexisted peacefully because 
they occupy different niches within their respective realms. But perhaps we could also say that this is one aspect where the two systems are similar. The Watcher's Ideology The Watchers are angels that were sent to Earth to watch over humanity. In the Book of Enoch, they mated with human women after arriving on Earth and taught humans forbidden knowledge, including astronomy, warfare and magic. The Book of Enoch also states that the fallen angels taught humans how to make weapons of war and cosmetics. God saw what the Watchers did and decided that he needed to punish them for teaching people's forbidden knowledge. He ordered Raphael, an angel who was a healer, to bind Azazel's hand and foot with great chains. He placed him in darkness until Judgment Day, when he would be thrown into a fire pit named Dudael, where he would be bound forever. God told Gabriel to throw Shemyaza and his associates into a valley of the fallen angels, also known as Gehenna, where they would suffer for 70 generations. Archaeologists on the Anunnaki The word Anunnaki means those who come from heaven to earth. The ancient Sumerian text states that the Anunnaki were the gods who came down from heaven to create humankind. It also states that the Anunnaki created humans to be workers and take over their work in mining gold. Ryan Mohan, a proclaimed scholar of Biblical Hebrew and an ancient theology researcher, claims they were not only human, but specifically Adam, Adapa, whom the Anunnaki gods made. In his book series, discussing Genesis, Mohan claims that Enki and his half-sister, Ninhasag, had created nine sets of ten pairs of humans, each according to the Enuma Elish myth to them to work on cultivating the land for food. However, this attempt failed as humans could not reproduce because of their pure nature until Enki took one female human named Tiamat, which led her to give birth to two children, Cain and Abel. These children later gave birth to normal humans, thus ending humanity's sterility after being taken by another god named Nergal, Cain and Abel's son. In Mohan's interpretation of Genesis chapters 6 to 8, he argues that a group of fallen angels called Nephilim introduced knowledge of humanity, causing a moral decay which led God, Marduk, to decide humanity be destroyed with a flood while saving Noah's family, since they remained pure, while other versions state it was Cain who came up with this idea. According to Mohan, Noah fathered sons Shem, Ham, and Japheth, after landing on Mount Ararat, where they proceeded to repopulate Earth outside Mount Ararat, with all men except Noah's descendants. The Nephilim, the Watchers, and Mesopotamian mythology are strongly related. As you probably know, the Book of Enoch is a non-canonical Jewish work that describes the Watchers as angels who rebelled against God and descended to Earth to help humanity. In their interaction with humanity, the Watchers taught humanity the arts and sciences, including warfare, and had children with human women, known as the Nephilim. Now it turns out that these same themes are present in Mesopotamian mythology. The Anunnaki were a group of gods, roughly equivalent to angels in Judeo-Christian mythology. They descended from heaven to teach man civilization and science, including warfare. And they also had children by interbreeding with humans. The Anunnaki were powerful in Sumerian culture, and Enoch was written during this period of history. Hence why Enoch has such striking similarities between it and Mesopotamian mythology. For example, Gilgamesh is credited by some scholars as being a semi-divine entity with one divine parent, similar to how biblical figures like Moses or King David would be considered demigods. The Anunnaki were from Nibiru and came to Earth to obtain gold to save their dying planet. In Sumerian mythology, the Anunnaki were a specific group of deities in the Mesopotamian pantheon. They were believed to have been immortal when they lived on Earth, but mortal when they visited their home planet, Nibiru. The term is derived from An meaning heaven and Nunake, Ne or princely offspring. They are also called Anunnaku, 
also transcribed as Anuna, Anunnaki, Ananaki, and other variations. The Old Testament describes a race of people called the Nephilim, who possessed extraordinary powers that made them seem godlike. These supernatural beings descended to earth from heaven and mated with human women. The book of Genesis says that these half-human hybrids became giants and tyrants who created chaos on the planet by dominating humans. The Anunnaki were from Nibiru and came to earth to obtain gold to save their dying planet. These Anunnaki, which is a word that means those who come from heaven to earth came, are more commonly referred to as watchers, angels, Nephilim or fallen angels. They were led by Anu and Enlil, who were brothers and shared the same father named Anshar. The Anunnaki mined gold on Earth, collected it, and sent it to their home planet Nibiru via rocket ships. The astronauts on the Apollo 14 moon mission in 1971 brought back with them boxes of gold cubes that they found lying around loose on the moon. There is this presence of gold because the Anunnaki needed it for their dying planet, Nibiru. Sumerian tablets discuss this information in great detail, but most people have not studied these documents, so they do not know the truth concerning our human origins and ancient history. More people are unaware of ancient Sumerian clay tablet records because most historians discard them as mythology with no fundamental basis or reality. According to Sumerian texts, Anu was the king of the sky, and his sons Enlil and Enki were the gods of earth and the gods of the waters. Enlil was the god of the air and commanded the earth's atmosphere. Enki, the half-brother to Enlil, was the god of the waters and the earth's oceans. Being brothers, Enki and Enlil shared a common interest in preserving order on their home planet. Anu and his sons Enlil, leader of the Igigi, and Enki, leader of the Abzu, are the only Anunnaki gods named explicitly in the Babylonian creation myth, the Enuma Elish. In Sumerian texts, Anu was also sometimes called Nuru, a title that appears in Akkadian texts as Anu. Anu existed in Sumerian cosmogony as a dome that covered the earth. Outside of this dome was the primordial body of water known as Tiamat, not to be confused with the subterranean Abzu. Anu had several consorts on Earth, one of the most famous being Ki, whose name means Earth. The Anunnaki are considered to be space gods. They are humanoid in appearance, and they like to portray themselves as being vast and mighty-looking. They come from the stars, and many of them have described themselves as the ancient astronauts who brought civilization to Earth. Anu had several consorts on Earth, one of the most famous being Ki, whose name means Earth. The Anunnaki came from heaven to Earth and landed in the Garden of Eden in Mesopotamia 6,000 years ago. They were a very violent race and have been historically written about as giants with colossal heads that look like skulls, referred to as the skull-headed ones. The Nephilim were born from their generic experiments, hybrids between Neanderthal humans and Anunnaki beings. These hybrids became known as the offspring, or Benai Ha Elohim. Anu has several consorts on Earth, one of the most famous being Ki, whose name means Earth. This name is also sometimes spelled Kia. Ki was the mother of Inanna, and in later Akkadian texts, she was called Antu, wife of Anu. Several other names for her are given in Sumerian texts, and these include Ninmar, Great Lady, Nintu, Lady of Birth, Belet Li, Mistress of the Gods, Ninhusag, Lady Mountain, and Mama or Mami. The last two names mean Mother, which refers to her status as the Goddess of Birth. Ki plays an essential role in the Enuma Elish, where she gives birth to both Anshar and Kishar. She is also considered the Goddess of the Earth. When Anu's daughter Inanna arrived on Earth from Nibiru, she became entranced by the beauty of Dumuzi. Dumuzi was the shepherd god, and his name means faithful son. He is also known as Damu, Adonis, Tammuz, Adonai, and even Orion in Egypt, where he was associated with Osiris. 
De Musi's arrival on Earth signified a turning point in humanity's history, a time when gods became men. When Anu's daughter Inanna arrived on Earth from Nibiru, she became entranced by the beauty of Demuzi. She determined it would be worthwhile for her to become his wife. So she kissed him, and together they had a son named Shara. Inanna was the goddess of the morning and evening star, which we now think is the planet Venus. Her name was also Ishtar, and she was known throughout history as Aphrodite, Astarte, and Athena, to the Greeks, Isis in ancient Egypt, and Diana in Rome. These gods known as the Anunnaki or Anunnaku, the term is derived from An meaning heaven, and Nunakine or princely offspring, were deemed to be immortal when they lived on earth, but very much mortal when they visited their home planet Nibiru. In Sumerian mythology, the Anunnaki were a group of deities in the Mesopotamian pantheon. They were believed to have been immortal when they lived on earth, but mortal when they visited their home planet Nibiru. The term is derived from An, meaning heaven, and Nunakene, or princely offspring. They are also called Anunnaku, also transcribed as Anuna, Anunnaki, Ananaki, and other variations. The Old Testament describes a race of people called the Nephilim, who possessed extraordinary powers that made them seem godlike. These supernatural beings descended to earth from heaven and mated with human women. The book of Genesis says that these half-human hybrids became giants and tyrants who created chaos on the planet by dominating humans. The Anunnaki were the gods who came down to earth in ancient times and started a colony, or so they said. That is what they told the humans. That is not the entire story. The Anunnaki were not just aliens from some other planet. They originally came from another galaxy called Andromeda, 2.5 million light years away. It was one of their colonies on a distant planet called Nibiru that sent them here to Earth thousands of years ago, but that is only part of the story. Around 560 BC, Nabonidus, Nebuchadnezzar the Twelfth, took power in Babylon, restored temples, and gradually returned religious statues called cellar stones to their home cities. In 556 BC, Nabonidus, son of Nebuchadnezzar and ruler of Babylon, ordered the return of sacred cellar stones to the land their cults occupied during their lifetime. Cults were groups with a sacred deity that singers and other deities would worship. Nabonidus' ancestor Nebuchadnezzar took power in Babylon in 605 BC, and he ruled for 27 years, trapping Jews into exile. After his death, it was thought he went to heaven. But that is not true because he fell from heaven and landed in Mesopotamia, where many gods came from heaven to earth. These gods are called Anunnaki, the good god, and they came from heaven to help the people on earth and landed in the Garden of Eden, now called Iraq. The story goes that 200 Anunnaki fell from heaven, but not all of them landed on earth because God killed some. The name Nabonidus means he who has built. He was king before Nabopolassar, and after him he was king again, and an Assyrian king until 556 BC. Were the Nephilim hybrids? The Nephilim story is a creation story. Every creation story has a creator, whether or not it is deemed God. In the Nephilim, the Anunnaki are equal to God, but are more right than God. In history and religion or spirituality, any creation story that involves something supernatural creating humans is wrong and sinful. Regardless of how accurate these pictures are of giants on Mars and Earth, if they exist in our time today, then they would have been created by some other supernatural entity. Are the creatures from the Bible's Old Testament Nephilim hybrids? The word Nephilim means fallen ones. The Bible describes two groups of people who were part human and part divine or fallen angels. The first generation of Nephilim and the second generation of Nephilim. The first generation of Nephilim was the offspring of the sons of God and the daughters of men. Genesis 6, 1-4 these giant hybrids were the offspring of the sons of God and the daughters of men. The Bible describes them as the mighty men of old, 
men of renown, Genesis 6-4. The first generation was destroyed in Noah's flood. Later, after Noah's flood, another group called Nephilim appeared in Numbers 13-33. This time they are descended from Anakites, Numbers 13-33, and are also referred to as giants, Deuteronomy 2-11 and 9-2. These giants also lived in Canaan. We find a few other references to these giants throughout Scripture. Joshua 14, 12 to 15, Joshua 15, 14, Joshua 17, 15, 1 Chronicle 24 to 8. The Bible refers to the Nephilim as mixed race human giants who lived in ancient times. The book of Genesis says that God created man in his image and that humans were given dominion over the earth. Genesis 1, 26. Then an entire chapter is dedicated to listing the descendants of Adam, Genesis 5. God did not intend for two distinct species of beings to coexist on earth. He intended for humankind to be alone and rule the planet. The Nephilim, fallen ones, are the offspring of the sons of God and the daughters of men before the deluge, according to Genesis 6.4. The name is derived from the Hebrew verb, napal, to fall or cause to fall. They are also known as Anakim, Deuteronomy 2, 10 to 11, Rephaim, Gibberim, Genesis 6, 4, Zamzumim, Deuteronomy 2, 20, and Emim, Deuteronomy 2, 11. They were heroes of old, men of renown. According to Numbers 13, 33, they were a race of giants descended from Anak that had occupied Canaan, east of Beth Horon, and westward in the land of Gaza. In Deuteronomy 2, 10-12, we read that Og, king of Bashan, was the last survivor among them. Moses described him as a giant in stature, having a bedstead 13 and a half feet long and 6 feet wide. Moses was slain at Edrai, and his sons Goliath and Saph. Where do the Nephilim come from? Nephilim is from the Hebrew root meaning to fall. The Nephilim are mentioned in Genesis and are also called giants. They were the offspring of fallen angels and human females, as mentioned in Genesis chapter 6-4. The Nephilim were on earth in those days and afterward, when the sons of God went to the daughters of humans and had children by them. They were the heroes of old, men of renown. What is a Nephilim? The name Nephilim comes from a word that means those who have fallen. Some believe that they are not real people, but they are something that has instilled fear in others. A few people have even claimed they have seen them. One person said about her encounter with one, He was tall, well over seven feet, very muscular, and paled with dark hair. I could not see his eyes well because he looked down at me as I walked past him. It is hard for us to know exactly what these creatures looked like or if their description could be just an exaggeration due to fear but we know how dangerous they were from Scripture. If you have read the account of the Nephilim in Genesis 6, you might have noticed that it is very similar to the Book of Enoch and several other sources. If you have recently heard about Nephilim, be sure to look at the Book of Jasher, a text from Biblical times, to explain how angels strengthened them. Were the Nephilim giants? The Nephilim are known for being giants. Some researchers have found bones of giants around the world. The Smithsonian Institute has a history of clearing out skeletons that exceed eight feet in height. In the ancient Middle East, giant skeletons were found with heights ranging from 10 foot to 12 foot. The Egyptian burial chamber was filled with giant skeletons ranging from eight foot to 14 foot tall. In India, they had so many giant skeletons that they built a museum to house them all. China has also been host to several sites that contained enormous human remains, up to 14 foot tall and weighing up to 2,000 pounds. Even in Australia, there have been reports of an ancient race of giants called Junjuns that could surpass 20 feet tall. Why did God send a flood to wipe out humans and Nephilim? The Nephilim were mighty beings who were so destructive that they almost destroyed the entire human race. God needed to stop them, but he did not want to kill humans. 
so he flooded the earth and destroyed all the Nephilim in one fell swoop. This also benefited from wiping out many evil humans. Humanity would be preserved with a fresh start. God's decision to drown them was also a way for him to show his power over them. The Nephilim could do many amazing things like grow incredibly tall, lift heavy objects without even trying, and live for hundreds of years, but they were still not above God's authority. This was something that all people should remember. No matter how powerful you are, or how much power you think you have over others, or yourself, there is always someone more powerful than you, and that person is God. So why did he send this flood? Perhaps it was intended as a punishment for humanity's sinfulness, or perhaps it served some purpose, only known by those there. Either way, one thing remains certain. When faced with such an overwhelming threat to their survival on earth, God saved us instead of abandoning us altogether. In the Bible, it is explained by God's great mercy that he would have never sent the flood if Noah and his family had not been found righteous. He mentions to Noah that humanity has done evil things, including homosexuality and bestiality. He does not mention Nephilim as a reason for him sending the deluge. God was wiping out humanity because of their sins, not merely because there were Nephilim on earth. Even with the Nephilim destroyed by the flood, humanity was still persistently wicked for thousands of years until Bible times, when God used his prophets and messengers like Enoch to warn them of repenting from their sins. The story of Noah is partly used as an allegory in which we can see ourselves in him. He represents us all who live in a sinful world where we feel our faith in God is drowned out by all the surrounding darkness. Some people believe there were Nephilim hybrids, also called Anunnaki. So are there connections between them? Some people believe that the Nephilim and Anunnaki are interchangeable terms. But this is a misconception. Nephilim means those who have fallen from heaven to earth. It was used to describe the Watcher's offspring on ancient Sumerian tablets. The Watchers were angels who took human form and mixed with women, resulting in forbidden offspring known as the Nephilim hybrids. The Nephilim mentioned in the Bible are nothing more than those of divine origin, fallen angels, and human origin, women. The Anunnaki is a race of gods mentioned in many ancient Sumerian texts, originating from Nippur, a city in Iraq. The Anunnaki descended from heaven and created a bloodline of half-gods known as Homo sapiens. Most people do not know that our modern-day human race is an upgrade of a previous model of humans known as Homo erectus 150,000 years ago. This species had been present on Earth for over two million years before being genetically altered by what we call God today, the Anunnaki. What happened to the remaining Nephilim after the Flood? The gods were at work, but most important to our story is how they interacted with humans. As the Earth's population swelled, we learned more about the ancient civilizations that once reigned here, the Sumerians, Egyptians, and others, left behind a wealth of information about their gods and goddesses and their interactions with humanity. Most stories depicted various groups of people inhabiting our planet before the Flood, or even before creation. Most commonly, these people are called Nephilim or giants. These beings are said to have physically appeared on Earth in over one form, some humanoid like humans, some gigantic bipedal humanoids with wings like angels, and some horned like devils. The ancient texts disagree on what these beings looked like. They appear as people, other times as animals such as dinosaurs, griffins, or giant lizards. Many also have them described as having animal ears or tails or horns growing out of their heads in a fashion similar to those found on goats or sheep. They were known for being powerful and vicious creatures from legends around the world, killing humans whenever they saw fit by ripping them apart as if it was nothing at all. The Nephilim were hybrid offspring of the fallen angels and human women Notice that nowhere in the Bible says that all Nephilim were giants, just that they were the mighty men of old, the men of renown, 
Genesis 6-4. It is also my opinion that there are Nephilim among us today. I base this on two verses in Genesis 3:15, which says, And I will put enmity between you and the women, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. As well as Genesis 6:4. There were giants on earth in those days and also afterward when the sons of God came into daughters of men and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men of old, men of renown. There are many theories on this subject, but I believe Jesus was born to protect us from these beings who would destroy humanity by their evil nature. We may never know for sure how many Nephilim exist today or what role they play in modern society, if any at all. There are billions upon billions of people living on earth today. So even if a tiny percentage are Nephilim, we could still talk about millions or billions. The Bible describes two groups of people who were part human and part divine or fallen angels. The word Nephilim means fallen ones. The Bible describes two groups of people who were part human and part divine or fallen angels. The first generation of Nephilim and the second generation of Nephilim. The first generation of Nephilim was the offspring of the sons of God and the daughters of men. Genesis 6, 1-4 These giant hybrids were the offspring of the sons of God and the daughters of men. The Bible describes them as the mighty men of old, men of renown. Genesis 6, 4 This first generation was destroyed in Noah's flood. Later, after Noah's flood, another group called Nephilim appeared in Numbers 13, 33, This time, they are descended from Anakites, Numbers 13.33, and are also referred to as giants, Deuteronomy 2.11 and 20.9.2. These giants also lived in Canaan. We find a few other references to these giants throughout Scripture, Joshua 14.12-15, Joshua 15.14, Joshua 17.15. 1 Chronicle 24 to 8 In the Bible there are two groups of people that were part human and part divine or fallen angel the Nephilim giants the Anakim descendants of giants The Nephilim were born from the union between human women and angels The Anakim were born from a union between Nephilim and human women both groups were giants The only difference was that the Anakim had three-quarters divine blood in their veins instead of a half of their parents. But both groups could be called hybrids. Did Greek mythology come from the Nephilim? Are the Titans the giants of the Bible? What is the difference between a Titan and a Greek god? Understanding the difference between the Titans and Greek gods helps look at where the two groups came from. The Titans were born of Gaia, the Earth. She was their mother and they were sometimes called Titans or Titanesses. The gods were born of Uranus, who was in the sky. He ruled over all creation until he was overthrown by his son Cronus. Uranus would then become Gaia's husband or consort. Did Greek mythology come from the Nephilim? Are the Titans the giants of the Bible? Unfortunately, no source offers a concrete answer to this question. The Bible does not mention Titans or any other specific Greek creatures. And Greek mythology does not mention Nephilim or any specific biblical creatures. The term Nephilim is not used in Greek mythology. The Bible and Greek mythology mention giants and tall human-like creatures such as the Nephilim, Titans and Cyclopes. But that does not mean they are the same. For example, the word Titan is not used in the Bible. It only appears in books about Greek mythology. However, there are some similarities between biblical figures and those of Greek mythologies. One connection is Goliath, a giant and biblical figure, with Titios, a giant killed by Apollo via a poisoned arrow. Another connection is Zeus, the king of gods in Greek mythology, with Yahweh, or Jehovah, God creator of all things according to Abrahamic religions. Did the Greek gods have heaven? Where did they live? Zeus was the king of the Olympians and lived on Mount Olympus, where he ruled all the other gods. His domain included the sky, thunder, lightning, law and order. 
In Greek mythology, even though there were 12 major gods and goddesses who lived on Mount Olympus, there were many more than just these significant deities. According to Greek legends, hundreds of lesser gods controlled things like rivers and oceans, and primal forces such as fire. Hephaestus, the god of blacksmiths, built the city where the Olympian gods lived. It was made entirely out of gold and gleamed in sunlight. It is said to have been in heaven rather than on earth with humans. A critical building within it was a palace for Zeus. This palace had a hundred rooms for every one of his guests to stay in. The city also had a spacious meeting place for council meetings among all members of the society. Zeus's wife, Hera, ruled over marriage. Poseidon ruled over seas. Hades ruled over death. Demeter ruled over crops. Athena ruled over wisdom. Apollo ruled over archery. Artemis was Apollo's twin sister, and she also claimed archery along with hunting as her domain. Aphrodite handled love and beauty. The goddesses did not have as much power or authority, but they played an essential role in helping mortals, people, understand how to live fulfilling lives, following their religion. The Greek gods were always depicted as having wings, just like the Mesopotamian Apkalu. Did any gods get married in Greek mythology? All the gods in Greek mythology did not get married. Some were married to other gods, some had many wives, some had no wife, and some even had a husband. The most exciting fact is that some gods chose mortals as their partners. There is clear evidence that Greek mythology came from ancient aliens. The ancient Near East heavily influences the Bible, so it is not surprising that there are similarities between Greek mythology and the Bible. It is essential to note that many elements of ancient Greek culture were borrowed from older civilizations. For example, much of what was initially found in Sumerian and Akkadian texts were adapted by Greeks to fit their needs. For example, the Greeks did not invent wine or democracy. They adopted them from other people. However, there are some significant differences between Greek mythology and the Bible. First, Greek mythology is based on polytheism, the belief in many gods, whereas the Old Testament firmly rejects such beliefs, Exodus 23. Besides this fundamental difference, we also find that some special motifs found in Greek mythology do not appear in the Bible. These include themes like a creation through the conflict between a god and a monster, such as that between Zeus and Typhon, or battles between gods, for example, when Zeus defeats Kronos. While there are stories about giant people like Goliath in the Old Testament, they are never called Nephilim like they are in Genesis 6, 1-4. Did Norse mythology come from the Nephilim? Are the Scandinavian giants from the Bible? The Aesir and Vanir are the two primary races in Norse mythology. The Aesir is a group of gods, while the Vanir is a group of goddesses. The Aesir is the male aspect of the universe, while Vanir is the female aspect, Dr. Henry Romano. Though they were once enemies, they became allies after exchanging hostages. The Aesir are the gods who dwell in Asgard, while the Vanir live in Vanaheim. The Aesir are led by Odin and include many of the significant figures of Norse mythology. They are distinguished from other deities by their association with war and strife. The two groups fought a war that ended when they concluded to exchange hostages. The most critical Vanir became part of the Aesir, and their realm was called Asgard after that. The Aesir are more powerful than the Vanir, but the Vanir have more magic. According to Norse mythology, Aesir means gods and Vanir means goddesses. The Aesir are the gods of war and law. They live in Asgard, and their leader is Odin. The Vanir are the gods of fertility, wealth, and wisdom and magic. They live in Vanaheim, and their leader is Njord, the god of fertility and wealth. Aesir has greater physical strength and endurance, but Vanir has more magical knowledge. Together, they create a perfect balance that ensures peace between them. Also, according to Norse mythology, Aesir is more human-like, while Vanir looks more like animals. 
they can transform into different animal forms. The story of their merging is told, which defines both groups' functions in Norse mythology. The two groups of gods in Norse mythology are the Aesir and the Vanir. The Aesir are warlike gods and goddesses that rule over Asgard. The Vanir are fertility gods and goddesses who rule over Vanaheim. The story of their merging is told, which defines both groups' functions in Norse mythology. In the beginning, there was a great war between the Aesir and Vanir that lasted for years, with neither side gaining an advantage. One day, both sides stopped fighting each other and sealed the truce by spitting into a jar. They took the jar and gave it to Gulveig, a witch who would not be killed no matter how many times she was stabbed with sharpened spears or burned at the stake, as she had the heart of fire. It is said that the Aesir and Vanir were warring clans in their history. It is also said that the two tribes reconciled after an exchange of hostages, or perhaps a truce. But there is no evidence that the Aesir and Vanir ever fought each other. Instead, the story seems to have been patched together from Norse mythology and Greek mythology bits. According to archaeological evidence, the conflict between Greeks and Trojans never existed but it was often depicted on pottery in Greece during the height of its civilization. In Norse mythology, Odin brought peace between the warring clans by sacrificing his eye on a well dedicated to Mimir for wisdom. Likewise, Poseidon's son sacrificed himself for peace between Greeks and Trojans in Homer's Iliad. They declared a truce and exchanged hostages. Once the Ezir and the Vanir had agreed that they were equally matched, they declared a truce. As part of this, they exchanged hostages to ensure that neither tribe would go back on their word. The Vanir sent Njord, Freya, and Freya to live with the Aesir as hostages, while the Aesir sent Hunir and Mimir as hostages for the Vanir. In addition, they performed a ritual in which they touched each other's spears, the symbol of honor between warriors, and spat into a vat as an act of good faith. Honia was placed under Odin's protection, who gave him a proper place among his men. Mimir stayed with him for many years, until he was killed by the Vanir's demands for more wisdom from him than he could give them. Odin ordered both sides to stop fighting and prepare for war again upon hearing this news. The hostage given to the Aesir was Njord, and his children Freya and Freya. Njord is the Norse god of the sea, wind and prosperity. He is also the father of Freyr, god of fertility, and Freya, goddess of love and fertility. His origins are unknown, as he was a member of the Vanir tribe adopted by the Aesir tribe. After the war between the Aesir and Vanir, it was decided that hostages would be exchanged between them to ensure each side remained peaceful. The hostage given to the Aesir was Njord and his children Freya and Freya. Once they arrived in Asgard, the realm where the gods lived. Their host became Odin, king of the gods. He remained serving Odin for many years until he finally returned to Vanahimra, home of the Vanir, where he continued as a god under his original title. The Aesir sent Honir and Mimir as hostages to the Vanir clan. The Vanir clan is one of two groups of gods in Norse mythology. The other group is called Aesir, the term Aesir refers to the principal gods of Asgard, who were said to have come from Asia. Odin, Frigg, Thor, Baldur, Tyr, and Hymdol. The Vanir are associated with fertility, wisdom, and magic, while the Aesir are connected to war and strength. In order to reconcile with the Vanir, Odin had his brother Vili and Ve resurrect Kvasir from his body parts, then give him all of their intelligence so that he could answer any questions put to him by either clan of gods or men, effectively making him an arbitrator between them. The Vanir are the fertility gods, with a few notable examples being Njord and Freya. The Aesir is associated with war and crafting. Because of their different dispositions, the Aesir and Vanir eventually went to war against each other, possibly because of disputes over control over humanity. After a while, they became so evenly matched that they resorted to fighting each other with magic, which ended in a stalemate after both clans 
used their respective magical powers to turn themselves into animals. In order to reconcile with the Vanir, Odin had his brother Vili and Ve resurrect Kvasir from his body parts, then give him all of their intelligence so that he could answer any questions put to him by either clan of gods or men, effectively making him an arbitrator between them. However, when two dwarves named Fjalla and Gala murdered Kvasir for his blood, which was said to be very sweet, which they used as inspiration for what would become mead, this would be how he got his name as the wisest man. It was said that whoever drank from this sacred beverage would be given immense knowledge and wisdom. Was Og king of Bashan an Amorite giant? Og was first mentioned in the Bible in Deuteronomy 3, 1 to 13, where Moses recounted how he and his men had defeated Og king of Bashan. He described Og as a giant, Deuteronomy 3:11 leading many to believe he was an Amorite giant. Or was he? Who was Og, and where did he come from? You may already be familiar with the name Og, king of Bashan. He is mentioned briefly in the Bible as a giant defeated by Moses and his army. This article will explore some theories about Og's origins, asking questions like, was he a descendant of giants? What was his relationship to other giant races mentioned in the Bible? Furthermore, most importantly, where did he come from? Og was descended from the Rephaim. The Rephaim is one of several biblical races that were considered giants. They are first mentioned in Genesis 14, when four kings allied themselves to wage war against five others, including Sodom and Gomorrah. Some accounts state that there were only three kings involved in this war. But no matter how many there were, Og was not among them. It was believed that these kings were descendants of the Rephaim. Although Og does not appear here, he appears in Deuteronomy 3.11. Only Og, king of Bashan, remained of the remnant of giants. Behold, his bedstead was a bedstead of iron. It is not in Rabbath of the children, Ammon. Nine cubits, thirteen feet, was the length thereof, and four cubits, six feet, the breadth of it. Bashan is located east of Manasseh, a northeast of Gilead on Mount Hermon, which makes perfect sense given what we know about Og's ancestors. The Rephaim lived near Mount Hermon according to Deuteronomy 2, 10-12, Joshua 13, 12, 15, 8, 17, 15. It is also worth noting that all three cities, Rabbah, Manasseh, and Gilead, are not only near each other geographically, but also have names associated with men or masculine deities. Rabbah is thought to mean the Great One, Manasseh means forgetful, and Gilead means Hill of Testimony. How giant was Og? In the Bible, Og is mentioned in Deuteronomy 3.11 and Numbers 21, 33-35. As one of the last kings of the Rephaim, he was also a giant, as evidenced in Numbers 13, 32-33 which says that he was over six cubits tall. The exact size of Goliath's bed. For those who are not as familiar with ancient measurements, a cubit is about 18 inches long. Therefore, Og would have been at least nine feet tall. That is impressive, but not unusual for refame giants. The bed he slept in was over 14 cubits long by six cubits wide, over 21 feet by nine feet. Sihon the Amorite, held Og's kingdom. Since Og's kingdom was held by Sihon the Amorite, Og himself was an Amorite. Exodus describes Sihon as massive and Joshua tells us that Sihon was a descendant of the Rephaim, who were giants. It is possible that Og was also a giant, but we cannot be sure of this point. Moses does not mention Og's size. Deuteronomy 3.11 says that his bed measured nine cubits by four, about 13 feet by 6 feet. This is not necessarily significant when we consider that Goliath's height was 6 cubits and a span approximately 9 feet, while his armor-bearer was 5 cubits tall, 7.5 feet, 1 Samuel 17, 4-5. If the giant Goliath had an armor-bearer who stood 7.5 feet tall, it would seem reasonable to assume that 9 by 6 foot beds were reasonably standard 
throughout ancient Israel and the Anakim. Balaam's prophecy about Bashan. We should begin our discussion of Og by looking at a prophecy given by the prophet Balaam, which we find in Numbers 24, 15 to 17. In this prophecy, we are told that Og was descended from Beor, Numbers 21, 27, and that God used him to deliver this prophetic word. It is also recorded here that Og's eye was closed when he delivered this prophecy. And he took up his parable and said, Balaam, the son of Beor, says, The man whose eye was closed says, He says who hears the words of God, who sees the vision of the Almighty, falling down, but having his eyes uncovered. Og was a giant based on all the biblical evidence. Moreover, if so, he must have been a Rephaim, as they were the only known giants. Og was the last king who ruled over a territory that had once belonged to the ancient Rephaim. Only one thing is sure, the Rephaim were real, and their existence can be reconciled with modern science. Og, king of Bashan, was a post-flood giant with an enormous bed and the last king to rule over a part of ancient Rephaim territory. Og, a giant of the last king of the Rephaim, ruled over a part of ancient Bashan territory. His kingdom was one of several former territories of the Rephaim that covered most of modern Jordan and parts of Syria and Israel. Og was a post-flood giant because the Bible never refers to him as a Nephilim. The size of his bed is entirely consistent with those of giants in other cultures. Forbidden history of ancient giants, megalithic mound builders with red hair. Lost ancient human civilizations. The Nephilim giants were a race of red-haired humanoids that lived on Earth in the distant past. Having originated in the Middle East, they spread as far as the British Isles in Europe and possibly the New World. DNA evidence in Ireland and Britain now proves the Middle Eastern origins. Although it is believed that the species became extinct during the Great Flood, many discoveries made during recent archaeological excavations suggest that this may not entirely be true. The Nephilim giants had six fingers and toes and double rows of teeth, which had been found at various excavation sites. However, this lost civilization stands out from other ancient civilizations because these beings practice solstice alignments. Megalithic Mound Builders Megalithic mounds are artificial earthworks with stone structures built thousands of years ago on nearly every continent. You can find them in North and South America, Europe, Siberia, China and Australia. They appear to have been built by a lost civilization from the distant past and many of the megaliths are still shrouded in mystery. Scientists say the mounds were mainly burial sites, but those who have studied them for years claim they were much more than just burial sites. Many believe they were worship places or other sites related to spiritual purposes because of their shape and alignment with celestial bodies like stars or planets. The Great Serpent Mound in Ohio is one such example that is believed to have been built almost 2,000 years ago by the ancient mound builders using exact measurements for astronomical purposes. North America and the Nephilim The Nephilim were a race of giants that ruled over the earth before and after the Great Flood. They were men of renown who lived to be hundreds of years old and had six fingers, six toes, three eyes sometimes, double rows of teeth, red hair and extraordinary strength. According to the Bible, these giants were destroyed in a flood, except Noah and his family, who repopulated the earth with normal-sized humans. However, evidence suggests that other Nephilim groups survived and continued their giant rule after the flood. North American natives have legends regarding an ancient race of red-haired giants called Sasquatch. Orbs of red hair for over two millennia, the Irish believed that the most potent and magical people on earth were redheads. In Gaelic, the word for a redhead, Mor Diarg, literally translates as Great Redhead. The ancient Celts had no clue what caused their beloved generation to be so dyed. During the Middle Ages, it was widely believed that people with red hair were cursed by God, a belief shared by many early Christians or that the colour was caused by a demonic curse. 
which also explains why Catholic priests are often depicted with bright-hued beards. During this time, there was a well-known story of St. Murdach, who protected his village against hordes of Nephilim that had invaded Stakelin Island. Because of Murdach's heroic deeds, he was given the power to turn back time and thus prevent the invasion. He then spent all his days turning back time until he died to live forever. This influential legend spread all over Ireland. In fact, it even had its verse. As long as you wear a shirt out on your farm, it does not go badly with you. All things will conform to your will if you are only wearing your shirt. Native American tribes and the Nephilim. However the Nephilim were on earth in those days, and also afterwards, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Furthermore, it repented, regretted Yahweh, that he had made man on earth and grieved in his heart. So Yahweh said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, livestock, creeping thing, reptiles, and birds, avians, of air. For I am sorry I have made them. The first thing we need to do is define what makes up giants in biblical terms, as there are a few different interpretations within biblical references. In most instances, giants are simply taller than average people, or possessed some physical abnormality that was unusual by those who wrote about them. Giants might be exceptionally tall, but this is not always true. The Nazca Skulls of Peru The Nazca Skulls are a testament to the ancient presence of a pre-Incan person in the highlands of Peru, who lived during the time of the first Andean civilizations. The giant skulls with elongated faces have been found at Nazca, an area in the desert of northern Peru. They date back to about 500 BC and represent the early Andean civilization. The elongated skulls may have served as relics from an advanced pre-Columbian religious tradition and suggest that these people were taller than other pre-Columbians. The unique characteristics of the Nazca skulls include their large size and elongated shape which suggests that they belonged to an extinct race that inhabited what is now modern Peru for thousands of years before being conquered by the Incas, whom themselves had anomalous features, all hairless, and used quippers, counting devices. The six digits, five fingers and thumb of giants. Here are the five fingers of giants. Giants had red hair, numbers 1333, Deuteronomy 2.11, 2 Samuel 21.20, 1 Chronicles 26. Giants were on earth before and after the flood. Genesis 6 and Numbers 13. There were more giants than people alive today. Genesis 6.4, Numbers 13, Joshua 12.4. Giants existed in many places in ancient times, including but not limited to Palestine, Gath and Jerusalem. Joshua 11.12 Most biblical giants had six fingers and six toes, but some had twelve fingers and twelve toes. 2 Samuel 21.20-22 1 Chronicles 20.6-8 Ancient history is wholly riddled with tales of giants among us. Many ancient cultures share stories of giants among them, and their stories are remarkably similar. Historians cannot explain how so many cultures worldwide had stories of giants with red hair, six fingers, and sometimes even six toes. It is also interesting to note that many ancient biblical texts show these same characteristics in the Nephilim, a race of giants spoken about in Genesis 6-4. There were giants on the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them. The same became mighty men, which were of old, men of renown. Ancient Giants, History, Myth, and Scientific Evidence from Around the World 
the Anunnaki. The Anunnaki are giants from Sumerian mythology who came to Earth to mine gold. They were led by a god named Anu and included Enlil and Enki in their ranks. Anunnaki is often translated as those who come from heaven came to Earth. Anu was the god of the sky and king of the heavenly host or gods. Enlil was lord of wind, air and storms and Enki was the god of water, mischief, crafts, and creation. Together they created human beings to farm the land and mine gold for them, which would be used as a source of power over humans on Earth. Ancient Rock Carvings Giants are described in many ancient texts and legends, but what exactly do we mean by giants when referring to these tales? First, it is essential to note that the ancient world did not have a universal measurement system, we often talk about size in terms of feet or meters, but it was far more common for our ancestors to judge size based on another person. A description of someone as a giant would best be interpreted as an enormous man, someone who might have been seven feet tall, for instance, rather than the ten foot tall giants depicted in fantasy television shows and movies. While this may seem a slight distinction, it is exceptionally relevant when determining how many giants there were during ancient times. To find out about the existence of giants from past ages, there are two primary sources we can draw upon textual records and archaeological evidence. Texts describing giant beings were written by cultures worldwide, including everything from Greek mythology to Native American legends, while archaeological evidence usually takes the form of statues or rock carvings depicting gigantic human beings or deities. One important thing to remember is that we must always consider the context when evaluating potential evidence for giants. Otherwise, we risk making assumptions by projecting a modern world view onto past peoples' and societies' beliefs. For example, if you found an old photograph of your parents holding up a fish they had just caught for dinner, you would make correct assumptions about what was happening in that picture because you knew your parents' background and values. Likewise, using context allows us to understand where giants originated in ancient societies worldwide. The Nephilim Regarding the Nephilim, they are the offspring of angels and humans. Although there is no evidence that they are giants, the term giant in this context refers to either their strength or their size. The Gigantomachy the Gigantomachy is a mythical war fought between the Titans, Giants, and Divine Beings. During this war, the gods were threatened by these groups of giants and creatures. The Greeks believed that they had to protect their gods from this threat. The Gigantomachy was a battle where the rulers of the cosmos were in danger of being dethroned by these otherworldly creatures. Zeus and his allies fought against Poseidon and Typhon, who wanted to control their world. Even though Zeus could defeat them, he did not win without a struggle. He had been wounded several times during his battles with them. During one of these fights, he lost his left arm, which he later replaced with an artificial one made of metal, iron or bronze. This story shows us how even our heroes can be wounded in combat against their enemies. However, they can continue fighting until they win. Zeus's principal enemy during this war was Poseidon, who ruled over water while Zeus ruled over the sky, air and earth respectively. They both wanted to prove themselves superior to each other, so much so that neither one would let go when it came down to fighting for ultimate supremacy over creation itself. However, as time went on, after many battles waged between them, both sides began realizing just how evenly matched they were during combat. Hence why we have seen instances where either side could come out victorious, depending on circumstances occurring around them, such as weather or terrain, features existing nearby. The Nephilim continued. The Nephilim are considered the origin of human civilization, and most scholars believe that their influence continued after the time of the Anunnaki. Some believe that the Nephilim were a separate species from humans, either genetically engineered or aliens themselves. Others have proposed that they were a separate race of humans, created by crossbreeding with the Anunnaki. 
Whichever theory you subscribe to, it is undeniable that human history has been shaped substantially by its existence. During the millennia before we recorded actual history, they came to be depicted as gods and goddesses in mythology and legends around the world. And many believe this is true even in our modern era. The Inca Giants You may or may not be familiar with the Inca Empire, a pre-Columbian civilization that flourished in Western South America and lasted from 1438 until 1533 AD. The Inca Empire was the largest in pre-Columbian America, stretching over 2,000 miles 3, kilometers, along South America's western coast. Inca civilization is rich with legends of giants, the most famous ones being known as Pariacaca and Titicaca Manco Capac, who are said to have led their people out of a cave at Titicaca Lake. According to legend, Pariacaca had five children who later founded five important dynasties in Peru. I just wanted you to know about all the exciting histories relating to giants that we have discovered so far. How do these giants relate to the title of this book? They do not. If you want more information about them or other ancient civilizations, like the Aztecs or Sumerians, check out chapters 4 and 5 respectively. Giant skulls found in Alaska with horns and double rows of teeth. In 1866, Byron Cummins was excavating gravel on his farm near Kenai, Alaska, when he came across a skull that appeared to be in human form. It had horns, and its teeth were arranged in double rows. It was huge, almost twice the size of an adult human head. It looked like the skulls of giants from popular myth. Cummins took this find to multiple scientists in the U.S., but none could identify what species it belonged to or how old it was. So he sent it to Harvard University for further study. But Harvard returned the skull, refusing to comment on its origin or age. Celtic and Norse legends of giants, titans and Fomorians. If you have ever wondered why so many people have had and still have a fascination with giants, you're not alone. There are legends of these beings in nearly every culture on Earth going back thousands of years. However, what do most of these stories tell us? The word giant describes a person of significant size or height. The term is usually applied explicitly to the race descended from Emir. More on him later. The word titan is just another way of referring to something that's powerful, or someone who has excellent strength. The Fomorians were described as ugly giants who lived on an island far away from Ireland. They were said to have a single eye and one arm, with which they wielded an enormous sword. Some scholars believe that the belief in giants came about because ancient peoples found large bones and then sought some explanation for them. This would explain why many ancient cultures have similar stories about prominent men or women, whose existence was once thought probable, but must be mythical today. Ancient Native American Legends of Giants and Titans Native Americans who inhabited the land around the South Pacific Ocean and the Southwest U.S. are famous for their traditional beliefs in giants. Giant people they believed were immortal, had supernatural powers, and often lived on a different planet or in another world entirely. They also used giants to explain how the Earth was formed and how humans came to be. Many stories told by Native Americans revolved around giant spirits of water and wind, that were thought to have done certain things during their lives, like create mountains or oceans, by blowing across the land with their breath or calling water up from deep beneath the surface of the earth with their voice. These stories are like Greek myths about titans and other deities who rose from the sea after being cast down by Zeus, who was later portrayed as an entirely different deity. Most Native American legends involving giants are pretty similar, one group of people being terrorized by these terrifying supernatural beings before eventually destroying them. Other cultures from around the world with their tales of giants. You may also enjoy exploring some of the many other cultures worldwide that have their tales of giants. Like the Nephilim, these giant creatures are often associated with creation stories and are endowed with superhuman qualities such as immortality, great size or strength, 
or even supernatural powers like clairvoyance or the ability to fly. Similarly, these ancient people believed that a race of giants used to live on Earth but was ultimately destroyed in a cataclysmic flood sent by the gods. According to legend, some giants survived by climbing Mount Ararat. The ones who failed at this task became spirits that continued to haunt humans forever. There is a long history of people believing in ancient giants. Some objective evidence has been found of giants. But they can teach us something about ourselves, whether they are real or mythological. We have all heard the stories of dinosaurs and saber-toothed tigers, but what about giant humans? Around the world, there are legends of ancient giants. These stories have been passed down from generation to generation for centuries, and you may have even heard some yourself. This article will explore these legends and actual archaeological finds that support them. While the evidence we present may be interesting, it must also be taken with a grain of salt. It is important to remember that much of what we know about the giants comes second-hand. Giants, Fallen Angels, and the Return of the Nephilim Proof giant angels once walked the earth The Bible and archaeology confirm that fallen angels once walked this earth and their offspring were known as Nephilim or giants. The Bible confirms that giants were living in the land of Canaan, a region in the Middle East. Archaeological evidence confirms that giants were living in the land of Canaan. The Bible mentions giants before and after the flood. The Nephilim are the progeny of fallen angels and human women. The gods knew they had been born, but they did not know where they were. They searched for their offspring throughout the earth, tilling it and planting it, and saw that the land was barren and empty. In those days, God said, I will make a man who is like a native of the desert. He will be from afar like the one brought near by birds. The Nephilim were on all the mountains of Israel and in Assyria. This is what they did to all the people subjected to forced labor. Their power was excellent. They came from one nation to another. Their power reached into Egypt and put Jerusalem under guard. It left its traces in Egypt, and its power was mighty there. It was so large that 400 men could not bound along beside it. Genesis 6, 1-4 Thus Enoch walked with God 3,000 years before Christ's incarnation, according to Jude 1.14 of the New Testament. He watched as Methuselah became God's father, while Enoch walked with God in a land where only his people who called themselves sons of Adam would be righteous. Genesis 5.1-32 He witnessed Noah's flood or deluge, which destroyed every race on earth except his holy ones. Genesis 7.1-10 then left behind a remnant called Jardites, who crossed an ocean between them, Ether II. They still speak today about their culture, which descended from these two giants, whom God chose for this significant role in history. It makes perfect sense why some other cultures would refer to them as giants when considering only theirs were supernatural beings who were sent by heavenly powers, and not just any powers, but rulership over both heaven and earth. In ancient times, many wise men existed among Israelites and Gentiles. The Greek translation named them. The history of Nephilim, genetics is lengthy and begins with Adam. God created man in his image. When Adam and Eve were made from the dust of the earth, all humans had a perfect DNA. It was not until Eve, the first to be tempted by Satan, ate the forbidden fruit, that she became contaminated with Satan's seed, which carried the fallen angel DNA, Nephilim DNA. Furthermore, when she gave birth to Cain, Abel, and Seth, those boys also inherited Satan's seed. Only Seth would have a perfect DNA again. Their descendants, Yahweh's children and Satan's children, inhabited the same planet for generations until Noah found favor in Yahweh's eyes. The seven Apkalu as fallen angels of the seven Nephilim cities, Eridu, Ur, Nippur, Kulab, Kesh, Lagash, and Shurapak. Adapa, Adapa of Eridu. Adapa of Eridu was a mortal man from the city of Eridu, the first city in the world. The gods assembled to debate whether to forgive Adapa for what he had done. 
It was said that Adapa broke the wings of the south wind, denying Anunnaki and humankind further access to heaven. Enki intervened on his behalf, saying that if he were given immortality in heaven, he would be honored by all those who dwelt there. Tiamat then withdrew her case against Adapa. But Anu decided that instead of sending him to live among the gods, he would send him back down to earth as punishment for breaking off her wings. Uan, Uan of Eridu. Sometimes called Uan of Eridu, Uan is the second of the seven Apkalu. You might wonder how these keep getting weirder. On a side note, did you know that the name Apkalu means sage? Uan was said to have taught humankind writing and judgment in his lifetime. He also dealt with the gods, which I assume means that he made sure they stayed in line. That sounds difficult. Kulfalgara, Kululu of Eridu. Kululu of Eridu, or Kulfalgara, meaning fullness of the great, was the first Apkalu in the Sumerian king list. He was considered the first of seven Apkalus sent to help man and is frequently seen as a fishman. The Babylonians called him Kulab, the Assyrians Kululu. To the Greeks, he was known as Kalkal, one of three mythical kings who was said to have brought knowledge from heaven to Mesopotamia. The others were Adapa and Uanes, Oanes. Uanduga, Uandukuga of Eridu. He was said to have reigned for 20,500 years. His name means the entire universe is mine, or possessor of the universe. Enmaduga, Enmaduranki of Sippar. You were Enmeduranki, the seventh antediluvian king of Sippar. You were chosen by the god Anu to become a priest and learn all the secrets of heaven and earth. You learned how to read signs in the sky, interpret omens, and other skills. You saw these things in yourself in your days, but today you help others understand their modern-day interpretations. Enmagalana, Enmagalama of Bad Tibira. The second Apkalu was Enmagalana, Enmagalana of Bad Tibera, the son of Enki and Ninuhuraga. He lived in Bad Tibera, the third city. He possessed the knowledge of writing, crafts, and the art of metalworking. He is credited with the invention of the potter's wheel. An Enlilda, An Enlil of Larak. An Enlilda was the god of the city of Larak, who is mentioned in the Seven Tablets of Creation. His name means the god of Enlil, and he was the city's first dynasty king. He was also known as Nudimud, which means the brilliant one, and Nigirsu, which references his father's name. An Enlilda was said to be the son of Enlil, who was king of the gods. Besides being a king, he was also considered a priest or prophet. It is not clear if An Enlilda ruled at any point during his lifetime or only after that time when he became ruler over all the other gods. The seven Apkalas are part of a cultural hero narrative that begins in Sumerian city-states, moves eastward to the Akkadian Empire and the old Babylonian period, then into the Hittite Empire, and then into Greek civilization, where they influence Hesiod's Theogony. The seven Apkalas are described as Uana Adapa, the first Apkalu, who was an advisor to Adapa, Adam. He was later called Adapa. He is known as Oannes in Berosus Babliniaca. Ukunishahu, the second Apkalu, advisor to King Enki Eridug by the name of Asaraluhi, in Berosus' account, he is also called Eudoreskos, Ukuninimjina, the third Apkalu, also an advisor to Enki Eridug by the name of Dumuzid, Tammuz, Enmeduranki, the fourth Apkalu and king of Sippar, which he ruled with his wife Sherida, Shiras. In Berus's account, this character is called Ardat Lili, one of many Xixuthros, Noah wives, who assisted him during their escape from the flood. She saved herself by boarding the boat with her husband and family, disguised as a man. According to Idin Dagan, she came from Shurapak instead of Sippar. She survived despite not being on board because she fell asleep under some bushes. 
and escaped drowning when everyone else drowned. This character's relationship with Xixuthros Ziusudra is like Atrahasis Ziusudra and his wife Barsip in the Epic of Atrahasis. The greatest Sumerian epic poems that talk about the Anunnaki. Inanna and the Hulupu Tree. Inanna is one of Sumerian mythology's most well-known gods, the goddess of love and war. Inanna was important for issues that concerned women, such as fertility, childbirth, and sexual activity. Inanna's story starts with trying to find a tree to plant in her garden, a hulupu tree central to Sumerian history. These trees were raised from saplings to be used in shipbuilding. In this poem, you discover that Inanna wanted to plant the hulupu tree on her planet so that she could make wood for boats there too. This is an epic tale about Inanna's battle with three different forces trying to claim the tree for their kingdom. Enmerkar and Ensukeshtana Ensukeshtana is the lord of Arata, a city in the mountains east of Uruk. A messenger brings Enmerkar news that his rival has built a great wall around his city, which he doubtless feels will make it impregnable. Besides insulting Enmerkar, this action threatens the trade between Uruk and Arata, including sending precious metals and stones from Arata to Enmerkar. Ensukeshtana's decision to build a wall around his city is an act of arrogance that offends not just Enmerkar but also Inanna, who demands that Enmerkar take revenge for her by conquering Arata. The story of how he does this makes up the rest of the poem. The Death of Demuzid the Death of Demuzid, also called The Dream of Demuzid or Demuzid's Dream, is a Sumerian poem composed around 2000 BCE in the city-state of Ur. It relates to the dream vision of a man named Demuzid, in which he is condemned to die by being torn apart by the Gala demons. You may have heard this story before under its Greek name, The Descent of Inanna, but it is not until you dig into the original text that you can understand what this myth means for Sumerian society and culture. This piece is fascinating because it was written at about the same time as the ancient Egyptian Book of Gates, which tells a very similar story about an important god dying each night before being reborn again in the morning. Both stories are a part of a more significant cultural movement that values death and rebirth as cycles necessary for life to exist. This perspective allowed people to come to terms with their inevitable deaths without giving up on their hopes and dreams while they were alive, besides giving us insight into how ancient people viewed their mortality. She had been conceived as a young girl who loved pretty things, but mainly was concerned with herself. But she has undergone a metamorphosis into something much darker, one who must be appeased through sacrifice, lest her power destroy her worshippers. Inanna and Shukalatuda. Enlil and Ninlil are the first millennia BCE Sumerian epic poems about Enlil and his wife Ninlil. The poem also references Enlil's children, including the sun god Utu, the goddess Inanna, and possibly Nana. The poem begins with an invocation to Inanna, Nana, Utu, An, the sky, Enki, Damkila, and Mami. The epic continues with a prologue in which the king of Kish takes over from Ianatum as the king of Uruk. After this follows an account of how Eresh Kigal came to be the queen of the underworld. Inanna was lured into marrying Gugalana, the bull of heaven. The last section concerns Inanna's descent into the underworld to rescue her husband, Demuzid, who had recently died. The poem ends without concluding because it is incomplete or oh, there was no proper ending. The Lament of Ningal The Lament of Ningal, written by the Sumerian poet Nidaba, is a lamentation in praise of the goddess Inanna and her lover Demuzid. In this poem, Ningal mourns the death of Demuzid and bemoans his absence. The goddess Inanna cries out to her mother, Ninshubur, for help as she journeys to the underworld to find her beloved. Though many scholars have sought to determine precisely who or what Demuzid is, there are multiple theories on whether he was a human shepherd king or an Anunnaki god. Regardless, his love for Inanna seems genuine, and their relationship has endured time as one of history's greatest love stories from ancient Mesopotamia.
A Hymn to Nergal Though it is a hymn to Nergal, the Babylonian god of plague and pestilence, this poem is called A Hymn to Enlil, because it was written in honor of the Sumerian god Enlil. Like many other summer poems, it was originally written on clay tablets. It is full of praise for the great gods and goddesses whose names are sprinkled throughout its verses. A vital verse reads, So you may be, may your heart be happy, may you give life to all lands. The Myth of Etana The Myth of Etana is a Sumerian poem about one of the first kings of Kish, a city whose ruins can still be seen today. His name means eagle, and the gods gave him an eagle. With the help of this eagle, Etana wants to fly to heaven and find a plant called the plant of birth that will allow him to have children. The gods agree to this plan, so he flies up into the sky on his eagle. Unfortunately, when they reach heaven, the eagle abandons him. Some scholars argue that Etana is a mythological character, but there are references in other Sumerian texts to kings who go by this name, including one who lived around 2700 BCE. Therefore, it is possible that he was a natural person in history. Ninurta's Return to Nibiru Ninurta's Return to Nibiru is another great Sumerian poem about Ninurta, the son of Enlil and Ninlil. In this epic, Ninurta returns to Nibiru. After a victory over the evil Asak, he is greeted warmly by his father Enlil and mother Ninlil as he arrives at Nibiru. His father shows him off to all the people of Nibiru, saying that he has cut off the head of Asag and built a shrine to himself with it, which will forever serve as a reminder of his greatness. Thus Ninurta was given the title of Suen, which means the Lord of Wisdom. Lugal Banda in the Mountain Cave You may know of Lugal Banda, the wise warrior and king of Uruk. Did you know Lugal Banda was also an epic hero? This tale takes place in the mountains where Enmerkar, the son of Lugalbanda's sister, is building a temple. Here, Lugalbanda is introduced to the Anunnaki god Ninsun, while on his journey to find Enmerkar. The story is significant because it shows us how mortals interacted with the gods in ancient Sumerian society. The Adventures of Ninurta Ninurta was a god of war who was also the god of agriculture, like other gods of war. He was the son of Enlil, his mother being Ninlil, and he was married to Bao, the goddess of dogs and healing. His weapons were a bow that could shoot thunderbolts and a mace named Sharor, which could speak. He defeated Anzu, who had stolen the Tablet of Destinies from Enlil's temple in Nippur. Ninurta also fought against Tiamat with his thunderbolt arrows during his adventures. The King of Justice Sumerian epic poems are most commonly found on clay tablets, but this is not the only medium used. When reading a Sumerian epic poem, you'll find a mix of the first person, second person, and third person points of view. This allows the reader to be drawn into the story through multiple perspectives. While reading the King of Justice Sumerian epic poem, there is an essential distinction between first person and second person points of view, as they relate to each other in this specific storyline. Sumerian literature was rich with epics and poems about the Anunnaki. Sumerian literature is filled with many examples of these epic poems, the Epic of Gilgamesh, which tells the story of a heroic king who slew the demon Humbaba, is one example. Another major Sumerian epic describes a flood, profoundly similar to the biblical story of Noah and his ark. Although no gods are mentioned in this poem, the Anunnaki likely played a role in its creation.